Hello everyone and welcome to another session of AP Human Geography with Mr. Elrod. We're continuing on with our conversation in population and population numbers. Uh, the numbers we're talking about today though are just a little bit different uh, from the numbers we've talked about previously. Previously we looked really just the population itself and what numbers we could gather from the population, how it's growing. Uh, it might tell us a little about development, those types of things. Today we're just going to be talking about density. Uh, now the density of an area is going to be important because it lets us know really how many people are fitting into an area uh, and what struggles that particular area may or may not be undergoing and it might lead us a little bit to a conversation on development. So the three types of density we're talking about today are arithmetic density, also known as population density, physiological density, and agricultural density. Uh, and so let's go ahead and get started and we'll talk about uh, each of these one at a time. The first one we're talking about is what's called arithmetic density. Now arithmetic density really is just the most basic type of density and really what all we're looking at is the total number of people that live in an area that's divided by the total amount of land area. And most of the time you're going to find this in square kilometers. Now obviously uh, when we look at this uh, we're just really looking at how many people are living in a particular area and, and the more dense the area is uh, the more people are living per square kilometer and you can think about all the difficulties that might come about from a lot of people living in uh, confined space especially when you when it comes to health and sanitation some of the biggest issues that have arisen in history and especially in urban areas are sanitation issues when it comes to things like clean drinking water uh, passing on communicable diseases very easily uh, things along those lines now some of the things that this is, or one of the things that this is not going to tell us, it really doesn't tell us where people are concentrated. So arithmetic density a lot of times can actually be kind of tricky because it, it'll be misleading. Uh, if we look at some, of, if we go to our World Bank information, and we look at uh, some of the countries in terms of their population density, of course we see some countries that are, uh, that are very low in terms of their population density. A good example might be uh, Canada. You see this uh, can, uh, Canada's population density is only four people per square kilometers. Now, if you can think about your physical geography, you know most of northern Canada is, or some of northern Canada is in the Arctic Circle. Um, you know, much of it is kind of rugged terrain, not very hospitable to life. Uh, and most people are going to be living uh, very close to the border with the, with the United States. And so, even though they only have four people per square kilometer, it sounds like everybody has lots of area to spread out, but that doesn't necessarily tell us the whole story because not all of Canada is, is incredibly hospitable. Uh, not hospitable, but sorry, uh, inhabitable. And then same thing with the Russian Federation. You look at that, only nine people per square kilometer. Well, uh, if, you, if you know much about Russia, you know most people live west of the Ural Mountains, which means that uh, not everybody is going to be concentrated in the same area. So even though there's only nine people per square kilometer, some, some areas of Russia, uh, they're fairly dense. So that's when we get to our our idea of scale of inquiry so it's very important to consider our scale we're talking about the national scale or some more local scales and so these are some pretty interesting numbers to look at we have Greenland up here with a population density of zero obviously that's just a, that's going to be rounding there because people actually live in, do live in Greenland Mongolia with only two people per square kilometer uh, if we go all the way to the most dense and it's not a country but uh, it's a territory uh, we have in Macau look at that with 20,000 people per square kilometer, that's pretty, um, that's that's pretty impressive right there. So uh, there you go. There's some numbers on population density, and we'll uh, we will continue to move on here. Let's see, pull it back up. So arithmetic density, total number of people uh, over the total number of land, doesn't really tell us about population concentration. Now I guess we'll pause for a moment. We'll talk a little bit about development because as time has gone on, I mean, if you look at Macau there with over 20,000 people. Uh, per square kilometer. Obviously you have to have a high level development, high level of wealth in order to support that many people per square kilometer. Uh, places of low level development can have a very difficult time doing that because uh, they're not going to have adequate infrastructure whether it be the buildings or electrical uh, electrical grids or uh, sanitation um, sanitation sewers or clean drinking water uh, to get to their people. Uh, not only that, the jobs aren't going to be available. Uh, most undeveloped countries, most people are going to be farmers or living some kind of subsistence lifestyle. So uh, you have to have a more advanced economy in order to sustain a large city. But we'll talk more about that. Now we'll move along to physiological density. Physiological density uh, really gives us a different perspective of the country because really we're looking at a country's ability to sustain itself and its population. So physiological density is the total number of people divided by the total farmland that is under cultivation. 
So really what we're looking at is how, uh, what ability does a country have in order to, uh, to feed its population? Uh, so this really tells us a lot because uh, those countries that have very high physiological densities probably are going to have a much more difficult time feeding their population because that means they have less units of land area under cultivation in order to feed the population that they have. So obviously uh, those countries with high uh, physiological densities, there's a couple things that we can know. Either uh, they have to trade with other countries in order to get some of their food stuff, uh, or uh, we might see a situation where countries are able to develop their agricultural technology uh, and they're able to sustain their population in that manner. So it really just depends. But as time has progressed, we've seen uh, the ability of countries, especially more developed countries, uh, they are able to do more in terms of agriculture on less land and feed larger populations with less land. And so uh, it's really a pretty amazing thing that we've seen happen in agriculture. The last one we'll talk about is what's called agricultural density. Now, agricultural density gets more at uh, the type of jobs that people have in a country and uh, the level of development that's in that country. And that agricultural density is the total number of farmers per unit of arable land. So we're talking about total number of farmers in a country divided by the amount of arable land that's in a country. So really we're looking at, again, what type of occupations do people have? Now, when we talk about agricultural density, uh, typically speaking, the higher the agricultural density, the less developed a country is going to be. And that is mainly because uh, that is an indicator that you need more people to work the land. And if you need more people, typically that means the less technology you have, that's, eight, that, that's the less technology that you have in order to work that particular land. In the most developed countries, we have uh, very advanced machinery and, uh, and agricultural methods where very few people have to work, uh, much fewer people, sorry, uh, have to work larger areas of land. And so we're able to do more with less. And so fewer people are employed in the agricultural sector. Uh, and so this kind of gives us an indication of that. Uh, it also kind of tells us, uh, gives us an indication of the agricultural technology that's available in the country, whether that be not only uh, the machinery, but also you think about fertilizers, you think about uh, the different types of crops that are available in, in terms of their um, genetic makeup or uh, you know, how close they're able to grow together, all those other types of things. Uh, and so those are our three densities. Arithmetic density, physiological density, agricultural density. Now it's really important to consider uh, what those different pieces of information tell us uh, in terms of what kind of indicators do they give us about that particular country. The last thing we'll discuss in this particular section is what's called carrying capacity and this all relates to the three different types of density that we've been referring to. Now carrying capacity has been a concern for uh, for people, and uh, I guess you could call them scientists, social scientists, geographers, really since the Industrial Revolution, Thomas Malthus is really the first one that starts to talk about it, and we'll discuss him later. Uh, but basically, this is just referring to how many people an area can support. Now, carrying capacity is going to fluctuate uh, across time and across space because some land, initially, some land is going to be more productive uh, than others. But what we're going to find is that as time progresses, there are several factors that are going to come into play in terms of how many people an area can support. And these are just a couple. Obviously, uh, with wealth, uh, let's, let's start down here at climate. Climate is going to be your most initial because this is uh, what's going to be, what's going to allow for a hospitable environment for people to live. And it's not just talking about livability in terms of uh, being able to, uh, to live in that particular area in terms of whether it's cold or hot or wet. Uh, but also what the ability for people to grow food. If we move on up, we talk about uh, technology and the different various technologies. Sorry about that. The various technologies that are available in order to sustain populations, uh, whether it be agricultural technologies, whether it be technologies in terms of air conditioning or indoor plumbing or even uh, uh, even building technologies when it comes to building large buildings and putting people in the same place, those types of things. And all of that uh, can be dealt with with wealth. Obviously, the wealthier uh, uh, people are in a country are, the more able they are to afford certain types of technologies, not only as a country and as a people as a whole, but also as individuals. Individuals can begin to afford uh, the different types of technologies to make their life 
more comfortable. They can afford more food to feed their family. So that means that moms and uh, moms and dads don't have to be farmers. They can afford the air conditioning. They can afford the house that's well insulated against the environment. Uh, so all of these things are going to help increase the carrying capacity. Obviously, the less the wealth, the less technology, the more that things like climate are going to be a factor in terms of how many people an area can support. So carrying capacity is always a concern, but what we've seen over time is that we see, as human beings, we seem to be able to overcome some of the limits of carrying capacity and actually be able to put more people on less land. And that leads us to this idea of overpopulation. Basically, overpopulation is fluctuating because what we're talking about is when a country or an area outgrows its carrying capacity, and as I was just mentioning, carrying capacity can either grow or it can shrink. Of course, it can shrink if you have some sort of natural disaster, uh, if maybe you have an economic collapse of some kind, uh, but things can kind of can go, uh, can, can either grow or it can shrink. But over time, what we've seen is we've seen carrying capacity increase uh, throughout history mainly because of things like improved technology, which I've been discussing just a few minutes ago, or we figure out better uses for land in, in terms of uh, more efficient ways to use land, whether you're talking about moving from the three-field system to crop rotation, uh, those types of things. So this idea of overpopulation has been a concern for a long time, especially as we've seen large population growth, but for whatever reason, humans b seem to be able to rise to the challenge and uh, and meet a lot of those um, issues as they arise. Now, like I said, in some instances you see a situation where carrying capacity might actually decrease if you look any place where uh, either a large natural disaster has happened, especially maybe in the Caribbean a few years ago. We saw Haiti um, have a very large um, a hurricane and a large earthquake came through and devastated much of the country, wrecked much of their infrastructure. Uh, until that infrastructure is repaired, they have much number one, they are very already a very poor country that was having a difficult time sustaining their population. Uh, but because of the difficulty the earthquake brought, then they're having an even harder time sustaining the population. So you might even say their carrying capacity at that time was actually decreased. Uh, and so again, that's something that can fluctuate. And a lot of it is going to depend on the wealth uh, and the technology available to the people in that country. Well, that's it for now. I uh, appreciate you watching. And hope to see you back soon.